Hello, my name is Matthew Deeprose and I work in iSolutions. It's Sunday morning around uh, half past nine and I'm making this uh, short uh, video blog to tell you a little bit about Blackboard Collaborate and what we're hoping to implement for you from Wednesday morning onwards. I'm going to be showing you a few slides that I've put together and then giving you a demonstration. And I'm doing this on Sunday morning because just like everyone else we're forgetting what day it is. We're stuck at home working. Sometimes we don't know when work begins or when work ends and with everything going on I wasn't sure that how much time I would have ready to for me to do any webinars or any demonstrations in advance so I thought I'd just put something together today uh, that will hopefully you will find benefit so without further ado let's take a look so I work in the iSolutions managed learning environment team and we're looking at Blackboard Collaborate and if I go through our slides. I want to give you some context about uh, why why we are where we are, tell you about what Blackboard Collaborate offers and the early implementation that we're doing, uh, give you a bit of a demo, tell you about the documentation and talk through some of the next steps. Now putting this in context we've been doing a big project that has only recently really fully started, which is to move Blackboard to a service, software as a service delivery offering. And the project was going to be in two parts. Firstly, to migrate Blackboard to the cloud and then to implement some additional services, namely Blackboard Collaborate and Blackboard Ally. But there will be a number of other really great new features that we will have once we move Blackboard to the cloud. So the contract was finally signed off in February this year and we began the migration project in March and back then that was purely talking about moving Blackboard uh, to the cloud and looking at the other things such as Collaborate and Ally later on after we'd done that migration. But then the world changed and on the 20th of March which is not that many days ago now, I was given the mandate to see what we could do to implement Blackboard Collaborate early. First day 26, we had configured it in Blackboard pre-production and back on the last Sunday, I started building our support website. On the 31st, began doing a bit more testing, documenting our rollout approach. Just last Friday, we did a soft launch and enabled it in our live environment. So it's there, but we're just making it available mainly so that some of our colleagues can test it without having to get onto our pre-production environments because on Wednesday in the morning, we're going to be adding a Blackboard Collaborate menu item to course menus. And of course, while all this has been going on, I'm responsible for answering the Blackboard and Turnitin support queries. I've been helping with some of the wider support for delivering online education. You might have seen the webinar that I gave uh, the other Monday, whenever that was about uh, discussion boards. Also, we're doing a lot of work still on migrating Blackboard to the cloud, particularly uh, on Tuesday the 7th of April Blackboard will be unavailable for us to apply a cumulative update which is necessary in order to put us into a position to be able to start doing trial migrations to the cloud. What is Blackboard Collaborate? It's a virtual classroom or meeting tool where participants can share audio, video, use an interactive whiteboard, Presenters and moderators can share PowerPoints, they can share their applications, they can ask uh, questions using polls, they can put participants into breakout rooms so they can work together for a small amount of time on something then come back to the main room and it offers attendance reporting and recording of the sessions and there isn't too much space for us to hold those recordings so in general, we recommend that you would um, 
save your session recordings to Panopto. But much more on that later on because we're still kind of getting to grips with how we're going to be implementing this. Most importantly, there is a limit of 250 attendees. If we would like to have any sessions for greater than 250, then we need to arrange that in support with Blackboard. So if you did want to have a session with more than 250 participants, uh, contact us via our service line to set that up for you. The overall maximum is 500. And it could be used by staff and students, and it might fulfill purposes such as doing a seminar, tutorials, student discussions, collaboration spaces. I also see it being quite useful for having a space for informal chats online, as I know that in our department we've been doing uh, like virtual coffee mornings and that kind of thing, which uh, I know at this particular time are quite valuable. And it's going to be integrated with our virtual learning environment, Blackboard. Now, the support materials will be in place, but I'm still creating them and soon I'll be inviting my colleagues to help me out with that. I've built up the structure and I'm currently working out what I can do quickly, what we'll need to spend some more time on and what we can ask other people to help us collaborate with. So we and I Solutions are going to be learning, you're going to be learning the tool, but of course I know that we'll be supporting each other's supporting each other and of course we need to be patient with each other because we're still learning about this new tool and like I said from Wednesday the 8th we hope to have a Blackboard Collaborate link added to every course so let's take a look in Blackboard so here I am in a Blackboard course you can see there isn't particularly a great deal of content on here yet. Edit mode's turned off, but it might as well be turned on as well. But what is of interest is we've added a BB Collaborate menu item to the course. And this is what you should expect to see from some point on Wednesday morning onwards on your course. So if we click on that item, we arrive at the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra page. Now, Ultra refers to the uh, this particular version of Blackboard Collaborate. They had an older one which required some plugins. This one only really requires you to use a modern browser such as Chrome or Firefox. Chrome is the best browser to use. You might also have noticed I've added this little floating box here. It will have links. Uh, it has a link to our website where you can find our guides on using Collaborate, a reminder to use Chrome or Firefox, and if uh, you have any suggestions of other information that would be useful just to have there in the forefront, do let me know. I think I'll probably add links to our staff and student FAQs. Now, every room, oh, sorry, every course will have a course room. And this is added by default. It's unlocked and available at all times. By unlocked, it means that anyone who has access to the course will be able to access it. So students, teaching assistants, instructors, and so on. If you do not wish for this room to be available, you can click on the session options available from these three dots and you can edit the settings or lock it so that only the instructors can access it and so on. But I think that could be really useful, uh, particularly if uh, you don't really want to go through creating separate sessions, which I'll tell you about in a moment, but sessions are like uh, bespoke collaborate rooms for particular purposes. I also could imagine it being really nice uh, for students to see who's online at the moment or maybe they want to arrange a meetup. When the students access this room they will be able to use their microphones and webcams although you can change that ability by changing the options that participants have within the settings. However, you'll probably find that you want to create some particular sessions. So the first thing I'm going to do before I go and show you what a room looks like is I'm going to create 
a new session by clicking on this Create Session button. So uh, I've got a piece of paper next to me as a reminder of as I made some notes as I as I went. Now this session maybe we'll call this um, the uh, seminar week two session and it's uh, going to be about um, or a particular topic I won't make one up now and you can see um, when you are new to collaborate it also will give you some little tips as you go which are, can be quite useful what it's showing me straight away here is that I could allow an anonymous dial-in so if for example someone could be you could be a student knew that they wouldn't be able to attend or they wouldn't have access to a computer at that time they could phone the telephone number listed and then enter a pin number and then they'll be able to talk into the session using their phone as a moderator you can uh, still mute anonymous dial-in participants but this can be useful if you are um, uh, your internet's down but you've got the number written down and you can uh, then uh, dial in on the phone or I have heard people using that have used it on a hands-free uh, device while they're in their car so that at least they could listen to uh, what was going on in the session if say they were stuck in traffic or they just weren't able to to make the session I'll just close that one uh, down Um, now I won't bother filling in the rest of the title of this uh, of this session but where it says seminar week 2 those words will appear as you can already see it's already being built in the session list here and that will appear in the browser title bar as well which is the other place where it will be seen you can allow uh, guest access so if you had a visiting uh, guest from outside the university or even just outside your course um, any number of guests you could give them this link so if you click on copy it will copy this link uh, to your uh, so to the clipboard so you can send it in an email and you can also say that uh, the guests will by default have a certain role now I already need to tell you about the roles so the moderator is like the top dog they have total control over the session the presenter is able to share content such as slides and participant is a regular audience member usually students would be participants by default and instructors would be moderators if you wanted students to share like some slides or use the whiteboard you might then make them presenters to be able to have that level of access to do so but it's all configurable you probably would not want uh, guests by default to be moderators you probably want them to be participants but you can then promote individuals individual guests to these different roles once your session has started you can also set some uh, date and time for the session if by default it's for the the next hour and after that hour it may uh, the session would end if it really were for an hour you might want to add um, some extra time on there sometimes they run over sometimes there's questions or things people want to go through so you might want to add a bit of time no end just means it will carry on for forever it would never end it's just open if it you wanted you can make this a repeat so if this was a weekly seminar they could say yep every week on Thursdays I'd like that to repeat and just like an outlook you've got to end after a certain number of occurrences you might be able to see there that the icon beside uh, the seminar week 2 has changed to a folder so if I were having repeat sessions when I clicked into on that icon it would actually show me the probably 10 uh, seminars running on these dates and uh, you see actually I've got Thursday and Sunday both selected so I might turn that off but I'm going to keep it simple I'll just turn that off for now now early entry 
it is recommended that you kind of open the doors 15 minutes ahead of time. If the if you do not set this option and it's only open from in this example 949, that would mean that no one would be able to get into this session until that time. Even the instructors would have to wait for uh, the 949 to come around. So it is a good idea. In fact, I'd probably go as far as to say allow 30 minutes in because people might want to test setting up their microphone, their video camera, or their webcam, that kind of thing. Provide a, sub a description. So you might say, um, like, uh, this is the session to discuss. Dot, dot, dot. We have some further settings. I'm scrolling around because I've tried to make it quite large so you can see. So by default, the default attendee role will be participant, which is kind of like a, that's it's probably for the best. And you can also, if you as a moderator choose to, to record the session, you can then allow students to download those recordings if you tick this button. As I mentioned before, we don't have a great deal of space for recordings. We've got one terabyte in total for the university at this stage. We can pay for more, but I think it will probably be most suitable that if uh, the session will benefit the whole cohort on the current course, to then upload that recording onto Panopto, and then we can uh, make it, or you can delete it from your Blackboard uh, Collaborator area. Because you uh, participants, moderators and presenters can all chat during a session, a text-based chat, the chat messages would be recorded and if you wish you could have those anonymized so that they are um, they're not shown uh, with people's names beside them. You have the option uh, to only have profile pictures for moderators because you can add a profile picture. This isn't linked to your Blackboard avatar. And the reason you might want to do that is more, I don't think it would be the case in um, if you were using Blackboard in a regular module, but if it was particularly large or um, there you were, it was more of an open course that lots of people are on, you may want to um, not allow people to upload avatars of themselves but I don't really see a particular reason not to at this stage and you can also say that by default participants will be able to share their audio so they will be able to talk share their video post messages and be able to draw on the whiteboard and you can turn these off and then you can enable those on a per participant basis so Later on, I'll be showing you that a participant could raise their hand and that way um, you could then say, oh, if you've got a question or you want to say something, put up your hand. They can click a raise hand icon and then you could give them the ability uh, to to do so. And I think I'll, I'll show you a bit of that in a moment. Enable telephony. Um, this is beside the anonymous dial-in. Uh, this would allow, once you have connected, that you could then dial in using a telephone rather than uh, the microphone on your laptop, computer or tablet, smartphone and so on. And I have got an example of why this is useful. Where I'm working at the moment in uh, a back bedroom, it's completely the opposite end of the house to where the router is. And I haven't had much joy with Teams and Collaborate uh, discussions uh, using the, uh, using the voice through the computer. So in my case, I've been dialing in, which has been uh, much more useful because the Wi-Fi signal at the end of my house is, is quite weak. You can also allow participants to uh, chat privately with moderators. So that kind of means that a student could send a private message to you and uh, that the moderator supervises private chats. So if a participant sends a private message to another participant, so a student sends a message to another student saying, how's it going, what are you up to? Then um, 
you would be able to see those messages and the participants, the students, would be told that you would be able to see their messages between each other during the session. So if I click on to save, I now have uh, my session here. So let's click on it uh, to enter. So I've got join session. Students would see something uh, pretty similar. They just wouldn't see the options below. If I click on join session, it now launches Blackboard Collaborate. Now, as I said, you only need a, you don't need any plugins. You just need a Chrome really or Firefox. You have to allow permissions for your microphone to be used. And then you can see, it can see what I am saying. Uh, so that's great, a little test. You have to give it permission to use your camera. You only need to do this once. And there is the uh, camera, so I can see that, that's working. If you had a separate webcam, you could use that, but you can only use one at a time. So um, it will offer you a tutorial. You can see that uh, as many times as you like. I'm gonna skip that and try and show you uh, the, the interface from memory. Still, it's reminding me that if I do want to see the tutorial again, I just go to the session menu on the left and click on tell me about collaborate and it will uh, go through that tutorial again. So it says I'm the first person uh, here and before I join as a student on a different device, I'll just give you a tour of the interface. Up at the left here, I clicked on this hamburger menu here. This opens the session uh, the session menu. Here's where I could start a recording. If you do start a recording, should I do that now? You get a little message, message saying that it's being recorded, but it is worth uh, stating this regularly through your session because students may arrive later on and they may not be aware that this tiny little red icon here means that the session is being recorded. So it would be good practice to, if you are recording a session, to repeat that uh, at least until everyone understands that this little red icon means the recording is in progress. Here I have the options uh, to dial in. Uh, with uh, on the phone, it would be charged at uh, standard network rates. You enter this PIN number once you've dialed in, and then you'd press the, uh, the hash symbol or the pound key, as they call it. I think on Collaborate, it's American phone line or it's an American voice, but that is a uh, I think that's a London phone number. Uh, report an issue. That's the tutorial. Look at the online help and privacy pro. Po privacy policy and down here we've got uh, leave session so at the end I need to click on that to leave. I could just close the browser but it's tidier to leave the session. Content normally appears in the middle here. I also can uh, see myself. This is an icon representing me. It's got my name. Uh, I've got a bit like on my phone, it says here I've got four bars, my experience is excellent. If I were going away, I could uh, click on there and then there's a little symbol will appear beside my name on the uh, control panel on the right that I'll show you shortly, uh, saying that someone is away. Uh, say I'm back and it's also quite a nice way to uh, express sentiment. So I could say, yeah, I'm feeling pretty happy about this so far. A little smiley face appears beside me and it will also appear in the um, attendee panel and the control panel. Everyone else can see this. But you can see there's a little um, count, kind of countdown thing, very small, just going around. I think that symbol is going to disappear after that countdown is finished. I could also say, oh, I wanted to go faster or slower, I'm confused. And so while you're delivering a session, you can um, uh, ask your students to say how they're getting on, yeah, particularly if uh, you're presenting uh, like a lot of material. Although, of course, in a webinar, it's usually good practice to, to have a lot of breaks, uh, to ask questions, uh, check on understanding, that kind of thing. And you've got to agree or disagree, so that's kind of a general expressing sentiment. 
If I turn on my uh, audio, you can see now I'm talking. If I turn on my video, it will give me a quick preview to check that I'm happy with that. And then it's showing my video. And I also have this raise hand icon so that people can see I've raising my hand. Now, in my testing so far, everyone, so participants, presenters and moderators can see uh, that a hand is being raised. So that's not anonymous. It's not something that only the uh, the instructors can see. It's something that everyone can see. So bear that in mind. I've clicked here. This opens the Collaborate panel. If I want to send a message, I can click on everyone. I'm still getting these little tutorial bits. Uh, so if I say hello, everyone will see the message hello. Now, if I remember right, if I arrived next as a student, I only see messages that have been posted when I have since I've joined. Although, of course, if I watched the recording later, I'd see everything. You've also got uh, lots of emoticons here. So, it, uh, just as an example, whatever that one is. So that here I have the attendee panel so there's the little sign saying my, I've, I'm raising my hand I'll just click on that again to lower it that would be so that students I mainly will be able to show that they would like to ask a question I have the option to share content so let me show you first a uh, whiteboard and um, this is quite useful if I um, I could choose a pen and a color and I can draw actually I've got a uh, touch screen and a, and a stylus so um, it's not too bad I could probably get used to that I might want to this one turns into a tablet so I could use it like that which would probably be quite good I have um, drawing tools from my testing so far these uh, do not do fill they only do uh, kind of uh, uh, just the line and if I change the color after uh, it doesn't change the color of this of the object I'd have to draw something new and then uh, it appears in that color from then on I can also this clear this wipes the whole lot in one go with the T, I can type in some text. It is quite small. I've chosen a totally inaccessible color, so maybe for the next time I'll go with something a bit better. But I wanted to show you that if I click on the arrow here, the select tool, I can pick something up, I can move it around, and I'll also be able to resize it if I can just uh, pick it up appropriately. And then I have my text. So that's the whiteboard to stop sharing. I click on that icon there. I might want to share an application or a screen. Now, um, here I could say I want to share my entire screen. I might want to share the audio. You could do this to fire up a YouTube video and share it. And if you click share audio, it should share the audio as well. But people are going to have varying experiences uh, with uh, depending on their bandwidth, which I'll tell you about more later about how that's going to uh, how well that will work for them. If I go with the application window, I can see the different uh, applications. I could pick a certain application or I could pick a tab. Now, if, uh, for example, I share a particular tab, then this gives you a preview of our Collaborate uh, documentation that we have uh, ready. And if I go back to the uh, Collaborate, or I, because I only have um, one monitor, I can't really show you how it's going to look from the other side. But um, maybe that would be a good point to, if I load uh, my tablet and um, I'm going to fire up Collaborate as a, as a student and log in. So just bear with me one moment while I do that. So it's going to connect and if all goes well, 
I'm going to do a screen recording so I'll be able to throw in what's happening on this uh, tablet as I go as well. So I'm accessing as a student. Now, because I'd already pre-prepared this, if you ever see a login screen, because it's kind of timed out, just do a refresh and um, you'll see this when I'm on my screen recording, hopefully. So I'm logged in as Charlie Blackboard and I'm going to go in and join this session. And when you're using a tablet or a phone, um, particularly with the video, it will work best if you're in if the device is in landscape mode because um, that way the uh, the picture or the video will work better. And what I'm going to do is just turn off the video. I mean the audio because I was already getting a. Um, the video of, uh, or the, the audio of myself generating feedback because the this device was in the same uh, same room as me, which is another good point about uh, in terms of technology. It's good to have a headset rather than using a speaker and microphone that might be on your laptop, for example, or your um, your device Bluetooth speak uh, Bluetooth headphones with microphone should work okay as well. And um, right now, I'm in as a student. If I raise hand, say Charlie Blackboard has raised his hand. So and I can see, yep, I know Charlie, you've got a question. I'll come back to that at appropriate point. So I can then lower hand. Or if I do it again, just to show you under the attendee panel, it's showing me that Charlie's got his hand raised. Now, uh, I was talking about sharing content. Maybe if I just go back. I'll show you sharing files and you can add images, PowerPoints or PDFs. You might have further files that you can um, share but I think um, if I go far up a PowerPoint first, let's just lower that. It will wait for a moment while it converts the PowerPoint. It's effectively converting it to a PDF so you might uh, find that if you save your PowerPoint to PDF and upload that, that it will be faster. Um, if I click share now, I'll just show the options. There's always these little uh, three dots here so I could remove or rename the file. Files that you upload will be accessible by all presenters and moderators. So if you make a student a presenter, they would also have access to these files. So you wouldn't want to upload anything confidential here that you didn't want students to see. So if I click on share now, it asks me which slide do I want to start with. I've just made a very basic file. So if I click on example PowerPoint file, the title, here I have the example and I can see on my tablet I can see the um, the file as well it's being shared now I could change look at the attendees and say Charlie I'm going to uh, make you a presenter and so now because I'm a presenter I can turn on my video. In fact, although I said it's better to be um, in, la in landscape mode, I've gone in as portrait anyway. And at the uh, bottom right of my Collaborate screen here, you can see that's me using the tablet. And because Charlie's a presenter, Charlie can move the uh, slides around but I'm just going to move back and Charlie could choose the pen icon and draw on the slide and um, in a moment it should appear over on this side as well although 
I think because I'm all using the internet all at once saying that I've got connection problems so this is a good live demo because it's showing uh, the types of issue that might occur and um, I can see it is getting there it says that I'm back so let's try that again okay now I've got it. So that was just I wanted to show that I can draw an arrow pointing at something. Well, um, to save um, to bandwidth, I'm going to just leave this session as um, myself here. I was still saying that uh, it's having connection issues. So I'm going to just close that and. I'll just close that tab and close that down for now and stop the hopefully the recording has just stopped I'll find out in a moment and one other tip that I had from a colleague is um, you might want to leave one of your slides or some slides blank so that you have kind of an instant whiteboard without having to um, keep on moving between slides and whiteboards it will then allow you to uh, to maintain the flow of your presentation something else that I quite like is if I go back to share content I can click on that little stop to stop sharing um, that particular file and if I add another file Here is a university map that I'm uploading. So again, I could have a, a large map. This pointer icon, you might be able to just see that as my mouse moves, there's a small kind of pointing hand moving. Right now it's just next to where it says interchange. This allows you to point things out to uh, the participants so that they can, they'll be able to see uh, that pointing finger uh, so if you want to particularly point out an aspect of what's on the screen you can do so with that and of course you can annotate uh, here I'm just using the mouse to draw this and if I click on this uh, clear icon it removes everything and one final thing that I want to show from uh, the view or share content is an animated GIF and I was quite impressed when I came across this that um, if I just open up this one it will load it up now another tip is to preload the files before you um, before your session so that you have all of these ready and people don't have to wait for a file to be loaded up if I click share now it will actually share this animated GIF which I, I find these are if you have the technology or you have something you can use these can be uh, much better than videos because the bandwidth will be smaller and the beauty is that you can also um, annotate them so again I'm just drawing an arrow, a directional arrow there so that then if I had something that was particularly suitable then I could annotate it that way and again click on the stop to stop sharing if I just go back to the share menu I can also ask uh, polls, poll questions and breakout groups but I feel like I've kind of reaching toward the end of uh, this quick demo of what I want to show you for now the other options if I click on this cog I've got notifications uh, people may really want to turn off the audio notifications as quickly as possible so where if people are saying oh there's too much noise when people are joining or posting a message just turn off the audio notifications but you might want to enable uh, little pop-ups as well I think because I've got incognito mode uh, for this browser session I can't enable this option if I close the panel to finish like I said I might first of all stop recording if you forget to stop recording it should finish about um, 15 minutes after everyone has left the room
then it should stop. And then click on the session uh, menu and then click to leave. It will ask me how my audio visual experience was. You don't have, you could click on skip, but um, I'm going to say, yeah, it was pretty good. And I click on submit. And now I can close that tab and I'm back at Blackboard. Now, if I just go back to my slides. Now, Collaborate is a synchronous tool, and if you saw the presentation I gave about uh, discussion boards, these are these will be familiar to you because these are some slides that I used when discussing the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous is all happening at the same time, asynchronous is happening at different times. The benefits for asynchronous, for example, using a discussion board, is not everyone's going to have great internet access or Lots of people in the same home might be sharing limited bandwidth. Students, uh, most students will have uh, a, a laptop and a mobile on a, a mobile phone, but some might have limited availability to their devices, depending on the situation they're in. There might be caring responsibilities that are looking after someone they're not able to attend at a certain time, a live session, or they might well be ill and unable to attend. So. Choosing the right tool for the right purpose is definitely going to be particularly useful. And of course, bandwidth is quite a commodity at the moment. So in the news at the moment, uh, lots of comment about uh, broadband being limited. And some institutions are saying that they are recommending more asynchronous rather than synchronous learning. And you might note here uh, things about China. I'll mention a bit about Collaborate in China in a moment. And a few years ago in South Africa, there was this roads must fall uh, movement and a lot of the universities were closed. And uh, Laura from the University of Cape Town uh, she wrote a very useful article uh, which if you Google what we learned from going online during university shutdowns in South Africa, you can see they had to learn new technologies very fast. Sound familiar? Um, the video conferencing was the executive response, but it didn't factor in unequal digital access and affordability of data. Now, in the UK, it might be less of an issue, but it's still something to consider. So asynchronous tools such as the discussion board were often recommended. So again, um, something to have a think about. Also, you might well have seen uh, this article recently by Daniel Stanford, Video Conferencing Alternatives, and he had this diagram, the bandwidth immediacy matrix. At the top right here, so at the top, high bandwidth, at the bottom, low bandwidth, low immediacy on the left, high immediacy on the right. So that tends to be asynchronous on the left, synchronous on the right, high bandwidth at the top, low bandwidth at the bottom. So using a discussion board is low immediacy, it's asynchronous and low bandwidth. Whereas video and audio conferencing offers high immediacy but uses a higher amount of bandwidth. How much? I'll tell you in a moment. But um, so my colleagues in iSolutions are going to be launching a survey of students to find out what um, technologies and broadband they have. And I've prepared a page on our Collaborate support site which goes through the uh, technology availability. So if I just uh, show you that now. So this is the recommended technology page where I've got some information about like what types of device, uh, uh, connectivity, tips, uh, some specifically uh, mentioned uh, technology from the user community. I've also got some information from Blackboard which specifies the type of bandwidth requirements for the different types of usage that you may make. So key thing I think is that audio is going to be 48 kilobytes per second or kilobits per second but it, you can go up to almost 1500 kilobits per second should be fine for most although 
uh, one of the topics uh, which is um, uh, even more important than bandwidth is the network capacity, jitter, you really need a stable internet connection rather than one where everything's fine for a minute then it all cuts out for a minute and then it's alright for a minute that's fine for asynchronous usage but for synchronous you're going to have a bad time also you might have uh, interests about the f types of frame rate, number of frames per second that users are likely to expect, I've detailed that there uh, some technical information particularly if you're working with um, organizations such as the NHS they might have particular uh, firewall uh, things that you might be wanting to check with them that's something we're going to be looking at um, sure and got a lot of information here about uh, connectivity with China which I won't go into now but I put it all there so you can have a look and a colleague at the University of York Amy Eyre, has written a very useful document which I've linked to which covers uh, that topic which I'd recommend having a look at also, I just want to give you an overview of the documentation that I've put together. So far, I have the documentation um, in kind of, I've prepared the structure, and next it's completing the content. So we've got uh, for staff and for students. So if we look at the staff page first, uh, these quick links will take you straight to a certain area and just to note still preparing this documentation so some of this I've completed some of this when you get there you're going to find that I'm linking to in for t temporarily I'm linking to other universities resources or Blackboard's own resources while we scale up our own uh, materials I'm planning on having a page about which tool to use for, for which purpose because we've got Panopto, Collaborate, Teams working out which is going to be the best uh, I have some really nice posts that I've taken from the Blackboard community site which isn't available publicly and I've kind of uh, slightly contextualized it and put it in here for now under best practices and you might well want to remove the collaborate menu item from your course so I've got a guide there and then we've got information about joining a session setting up sessions user interface all about those permissions sharing content and so on so you can see there's a lot is going to be there and uh, specifically breakout groups we have the opportunity uh, Blackboard are going to be providing some training to myself and a few colleagues which we can open up uh, we can have a maximum of 20 people so if you're particularly interested in looking at breakout groups then uh, there might be an opportunity to have some expert training right or very soon within the next uh, month or so so you might uh, be interested in getting in touch with me about that um, I better show you reporting on attendance in a moment um, and on the mobile device you don't need an app you just need Chrome on Android, Safari on iOS and uh, my colleagues and I have been testing it and it works quite well and we've got information about when you dial in for um, students the same format just slightly repurposed um, it's just more what's particularly uh, going to be of interest to students something else I should mention is that if you use groups in your Blackboard course you can have a collaborate area for those groups this is separate from breakout groups that's during a session a Blackboard group is where you might have a bunch of students in group A, a bunch of students in group B they currently they could have a discussion area file exchange area blog a journal a wiki with collaborate they'll also be able to have a collaborate area so that they can work together in real time on projects that kind of thing so um, I mentioned um, reporting so if I um, just go back to where I was with blackboard now I had a example session I was testing with yesterday and again if I click on this little icon here session options I've got view reports here I can see that there are two attendees who attended for a total of 20 minutes if I view the report itself then I can see 
there are two students who were participants. They attended through Blackboard, that's what integration, when they first joined and when they last left. If they lost their connection and so on, it, it's not uh, covering that. It covers when they first arrived and when they last left the session. Although it will tell you the number of times they joined. So if there was a high number, it might you might tell that that was someone who had a lot of connectivity issues. And um, it shows the total time that they spent. You can export that to a CSV and you've got We'll have a, a printable uh, form as well. If I click on that, you can see if I uh, print that, then um, it should look kind of OK on paper. And there, that was the, the name that I gave um, my example session, I think, was the name of the, the session that I had. And in fact, yes, it was. So if I go there, uh, you can see it again. So starting to conclude, that was the, uh, the documentation that I wanted to show you. And like I said, we do have the opportunity for some uh, breakout group training for a Collaborate. I have seen it, it looks great, but I, I'm still getting to grips with a lot of the functionality myself. So we do have the opportunity. If you think you're gonna have a particular use for that, you might want to, you're welcome to email me uh, direct or leave a comment on the video. Uh, 20 max participants, I'm sure five to six of those will be people from my solutions. It will be online for one hour and date and time to be confirmed. And because we're all working together, there was the expectation that then uh, you would then train or pass on that knowledge to other people and play it forward. Just on a wider topic, Blackboard, we're still moving it uh, to the cloud. And uh, I've chosen this painting because uh, a bit like the, the, the Temeraire. Our Blackboard environment is getting quite old now. It's seen better days. It uh, really worked well for us in the past, but it's time to, to move to something new. So we are hoping to be doing the migration uh, toward the end of June, but that will become clearer once we've done some trial migrations. We will reduce the downtime to as little as possible, but it's likely there will be some. But once we've got through that, the benefits will be that it will be more scalable. Something that I haven't noted here is that uh, we will get upgrades or bug fixes and some new features, whatever Blackboard provide every month. So rather than doing an upgrade once a year, it would be every month we're at the latest version and there wouldn't be any downtime for maintenance or upgrades. We'll be al adding Ally, which is a fantastic accessibility tool. And there'll be more features such as student portfolios, uh, content management, and so on. And because we won't be doing upgrade projects every year, which can take up to nine months with, there can be five or six people working on these projects, there'll be more time for actually developing and supporting the service. And of course, everything is, uh, subject to how life develops over the, the next months and resource availability and so on. And if you haven't not yet joined the Digital Learning Connects Teams area, you definitely should. I'll throw in some links at the, uh, below the video and we have our resources on elearn.southampton.ac.uk. Thank you for uh, bearing with me while I gave this presentation. I hope you found it useful. Uh, I'm hoping perhaps that um, I'll have some time where I can answer some questions during a Digital Learning Connects uh, webinar, but I wanted to put this together now because Monday we're going to be getting everything ready for Tuesday's upgrade. Tuesday we're going to be doing the upgrade. Wednesday we're implementing Collaborate and then it's Easter break and I'll be on leave until the 20th of April myself. So that's why I wanted to get the session uh, done uh, for you right now. I hope you found it useful. So thank you very much. I'm going to close this now and I'll see you in another video.